The BBC. You may or may not have heard of it. It stands for the British Broadcasting Corporation. It is the world's oldest and still the world's largest broadcaster, but recently, it has gotten itself into a bit of a pickle. One of the BBC's flagship shows is Match of the Day, which is the longest-running football television programme in the world. First broadcast in 1964, Match of the Day, sometimes abbreviated as MOTD these days, is broadcast every Saturday evening throughout the Premier League season, and it rounds up the day's fixtures with highlights, commentary and analysis. Well, except for last weekend, that is. The host of Match of the Day since 1999 has been Gary Lineker, England's all-time leading goalscorer at the FIFA World Cup, who won the Golden Boot at the 1986 World Cup in Mexico and scored prolifically throughout his club career for the likes of Everton, Tottenham and FC Barcelona. Like most footballers of his generation, Lineker isn't someone who has historically been expressly party political. Here he is alongside Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron promoting a campaign called Tickets for Troops. Here he is again alongside Cameron watching school children play football, exchanging a laugh and a joke. Likewise alongside Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair. Here he is lauding Blair on Twitter. Here he is ridiculing Blair. Here he is criticising Boris Johnson. Here he is congratulating him and giving him credit. And again and again, and here he is giving the most inane sit-on-the-fence non-opinion imaginable about Margaret Thatcher of all people. As you can see then, Lineker is no stranger to airing his views on politics, and a week ago today, he tweeted this in response to a now-deleted tweet opposing refugees from being granted asylum in the United Kingdom. Over the next few days, remarkably, that snowballed to a point at which it was the headline story on BBC News, and Lineker was suspended, reportedly, for failing to apologise. In solidarity with Lineker and in light of his suspension, not only did fellow pundits and potential hosts like Ian Wright, Alan Shearer, and Mika Richards all refuse to appear on Match of the Day, the programme's commentators withdrew their labour as well. In the end, Match of the Day was broadcast without a host, pundits, or any commentary at all, and lasted for just 20 minutes instead of an hour and 20 minutes like usual. I appreciate that for non-UK viewers, this might all seem a little bit baffling, but rest assured, the UK, and particularly England, is pretty baffling most of the time, including on this occasion, even to those of us who call this psychotic little island home. It is an interesting story, though, concerning one of England's biggest football legends, the country's biggest broadcaster, and I am sorry to say, yes, just a little bit of politics. So, if you are one of those people who gets very upset when football and politics intertwine, this is your content warning to switch this off and watch my extremely apolitical video ranking every Premier League player of the season from worst to best instead. But for everyone else, here is a rundown of what on earth is going on at the BBC, how a football presenter sent the organisation into meltdown, and why it is stupid, hilarious, and tragic in equal measure. I mentioned just then in the introduction that Gary Lineker's politics have never been particularly radical or party-specific. Lineker could probably best be described as a sort of semi-progressive, centrist liberal type, or at least, that is how I suspect that he would view himself. There are two issues about which he has been particularly vocal over the last five or so years though, namely Brexit, that is, the UK's exit from the European Union for the uninitiated, and therefore extremely fortunate among you, and most notably of all refugees, and those seeking asylum. Lineker's initial tweet, in the thread that eventually caused such furore, was a quote tweet of a video uploaded by the Home Office, in which the UK's Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, described the UK as being overwhelmed by asylum applications, bemoaned the cost of resettling refugees, and stated that her top priority was, and I quote, to stop the boats. Unlike a lot of governments, who, you know, 
try to fix problems and make things work, the UK government has a much simpler strategy of simply repeating meaningless three-word slogans. We had take back control during the EU referendum, my particular favourite, Theresa May's strong and stable in the 2017 general election, and of course Boris Johnson's promise to get Brexit done heading into the 2019 election. Well, Stop the Boats is the latest in this long line, and perhaps the most insidious of the lot. Following 13 years in government, during which time the United Kingdom has gone from being a far from perfect, but nonetheless relatively affluent and functional country, where wages were roughly on par with those in Germany and the United States, to one where living standards for most people have either stagnated or declined, real wages will still be lower in 2026 than they were all the way back in 2008, and the economy is expected to shrink more in 2023 than in sanctions hit Russia, the mood across much of the UK is bleak, the Conservative Party don't have a great track record upon which to campaign, nor do they have any positive ideas or policies for the future. The Tories are currently more than 20 points behind in the polls, which, for non-UK viewers, basically means that if an election were to be held tomorrow, they would suffer a landslide defeat, the likes of which this country hasn't seen, in well over a hundred years. Consequently, the Conservatives have decided to fight the next general election on what are termed culture war issues, such as wokeness, statues, and LGBT rights. You know, the important stuff. Not like inflation, stagnating wages, the housing crisis, or climate change. In case any of you might be thinking this is an unfair characterisation from me or an exaggeration, don't just take my word for it. Tory MP Lee Anderson, who is the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, stated just last month that, quote, The big thing in terms of 2019, there were three things that won us the election. It was nothing to do with me, it was Brexit, it was Boris, it was Corbyn, and it was as simple as that. Those three things together were a great campaign, great ingredients. At the next election, we haven't got those three things, so we'll have to think of something else. It'll probably be a mix of culture wars and trans debate. End quote. There you have it then, straight from the daft old horse's mouth. Anderson, incidentally, was a Labour Party councillor until defecting to the Conservatives in 2018 and being elected as an MP in 2019. The ever patriotic and definitely not racist Anderson boycotted supporting and watching England as they reached the final of Euro 2020 on account of the team's players deciding to take the knee, and he is a good friend of far-right stalwart Fluke Dudley, pictured here wearing a No Remorse White Pride t-shirt with a nice big Celtic cross in the middle. A nice guy all round then. Lineker responded to the clip of Braverman's speech by tweeting, Good heavens, this is beyond awful, when someone responded in a now-deleted tweet in support of government rhetoric, Lineker responded, There is no huge influx. We take far fewer refugees than other major European countries. This is just an immeasurably cruel policy directed at the most vulnerable people in language that is not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 30s, and I'm out of order. Question mark. It is this tweet, which, once latched upon by the right-wing press, came to be at the centre of a huge storm at the BBC. Except, it sort of wasn't, or at least, most of the people claiming to be truly outraged by Lineker's tweet had either never read it, totally misread it, or, and I think significantly more likely, chose to willfully misrepresent it. Within only a couple of days, it was being claimed that Lineker had drawn parallels between the UK government's asylum policy and the Holocaust, and that he had likened the Conservative Party to the Nazis. Of course, despite our old friend Lee Anderson's fondness for literal white supremacists, Lineker did no such thing. What he said was that the language that was being used to talk about vulnerable people was not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 30s. I'm not particularly interested in litigating that claim too much, since it isn't very relevant, but 
I will say that Suella Braverman has described the relatively small number of refugees who come to Britain as an invasion. The UK's best-selling newspaper has published articles describing migrants as cockroaches, and at the beginning of the Syrian refugee crisis in 2015, the Daily Mail published this cartoon alongside a story about Europe's open borders. Here is, you know, just in case you're interested, a piece of Nazi propaganda published in the Austrian newspaper Das Kleine Blatt in 1939. I present the two of them without any comment. The UK has also taken, as Lineker pointed out, a comparatively pathetic number of refugees compared to other major European countries like France, Spain and Germany, and has a highly discriminatory asylum policy whereby, if you're not from either Ukraine, Hong Kong or Afghanistan, there are no means of claiming asylum without somehow first reaching the UK and then claiming asylum. A fact that, even Suella Braverman herself does not dispute because, you know, she can't, it's true. Hence why some refugees take the extraordinary risk of travelling to the UK by small boats in the first place. This is all relevant context, I suppose, especially since there are so many misconceptions about how many refugees the UK takes in and how the country's asylum system actually works, but it is also somewhat irrelevant, given that Lineker's 1930s Germany comparison that caused such a storm, or pseudo-storm, among senior Tories and right-wing journalists wasn't in reference to policy at all. Following mounting pressure from Conservative MPs and peers, 36 of whom demanded that the boss of the BBC, Tim Davey, launch a full inquiry into Lineker's tweet, and from the right-wing press, who love to bash the BBC, envy its enormous reach and influence, and have great commercial interest in seeing it either privatised or abolished, the BBC did announce on Friday that Lineker would be stepping back from his job, presenting Match of the Day, quote, until we've got an agreed and clear position on his use of social media. I've no doubt that there will be people watching this video with a wide range of different political leanings and views on Gary Lineker, asylum policy, and government rhetoric. But this was, regardless of any of that, an absolutely insane decision by the BBC. Not because what Lineker said was right, not because of the importance of free speech, no, I'm not talking about any of that. It was an insane decision, first and foremost, because they had absolutely no grounds, as we have since discovered, to do it in the first place. There are supposedly strict impartiality guidelines, which BBC employees, including on their own personal social media accounts, are bound by. Most of those guidelines only apply to those employed by the BBC to cover news, politics, and current affairs, though. Gary Lineker works for the BBC, along with several other broadcasters, as a freelancer, and as a football presenter, not to give his views on news, politics, or current affairs. The BBC couldn't sack Lineker, therefore, on the grounds of that tweet alone. They would have had to have dismissed him, or terminated his contract to be more accurate, on the grounds of something like him having brought the BBC into disrepute. Now, I am not a lawyer, you will be very surprised to discover, so this is above my pay grade, but that instinctively seems like a very flimsy argument to me, and I am told by those much better informed on this subject that Lineker would most likely be able to successfully challenge the BBC if they did attempt to terminate his contract on those grounds. It turns out that Lineker is under contract with the BBC as a freelancer until 2025, which means that unless he agreed to terminate his contract freely, and why would he, the BBC would have to pay him the remainder of his contract. Lineker is the highest earner at the BBC, paid £1.35 million a year, so that would be a pretty expensive use of licence fee payers' money, especially since 53% of Britons feel that the BBC was wrong to suspend Lineker, and only 27% agree with the decision, according to polling carried out by YouGov. That brings us to the second reason why it was an insane decision by the BBC. Gary Lineker, contrary to what the Daily Mail or The Express would have you believe, 
is actually quite popular. Forget about refugee policy for a minute, Lineker is an England legend. Anyone over the age of 40 remembers him as an England legend, scoring goals at World Cups, and anyone under that age as the host of one of the country's most iconic and celebrated television programmes for the last quarter of a century. A whopping 91% of Brits have heard of Lineker, he is liked by 49% of them, and despite the best efforts of Tory MPs and their innumerable allies within the press, only 19% dislike him. That makes Lineker more popular in the United Kingdom than the likes of Sir Bobby Robson, Lionel Messi, and Sir Alex Ferguson. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, by comparison, who 95% of Britons have heard of, is only liked by 30% of them, whilst 35% dislike him. Suella Braverman is liked by a paltry 16%, whilst 30% dislike her, and Rupert Murdoch, who owns The Times, The Sunday Times, and The Sun newspapers, is liked by just 7% of Britons, and disliked by 56%. That makes Murdoch liked by the same percentage of Brits as Vladimir Putin, also 7%, and also makes him 3% less popular than Adam Johnson, a former England international who was jailed in 2015 for engaging in sexual activity with a 15-year-old schoolgirl. Lineker also appears to be fairly popular with his co-workers, unsurprisingly, who one by one announced that they wouldn't be appearing on Match of the Day in solidarity with him, and on account of the BBC having suspended him. Ian Wright was the first, later stating on his podcast that he agreed with Lineker's tweet, and that if the BBC sacked him, he wouldn't work with them again, followed by Alan Shearer, another stalwart of the show, and the rest followed like dominoes. Shearer and Wright, it should be said, are even more popular than Lineker. In fact, Wright is the third most popular footballer, or ex-footballer, in all of Britain, behind only 1966 World Cup winners Bobby Charlton and the late Bobby Moore. In short, making enemies with them probably wasn't the wisest move when it came to the court of public opinion. Then came a statement from six of Match of the Day's biggest commentators, who announced that, again, in solidarity with Lineker, they also wouldn't be commentating on any of the weekend's games for the BBC. Given that BBC commentators, at least as a rule, are likely to be much lower paid and less affluent than former pros and presenters, it was a pretty bold statement, and at this point, just a day before Match of the Day was to be recorded and broadcast, may I remind you, the BBC probably started to realise that they had made a pretty big mistake. It's difficult to explain to non-UK viewers quite how wild Jermaine Genus turning down a job offer is, but... This is a man who will host quite literally anything from daytime television segments about, I don't know, escaped hyenas from Colchester Zoo, all the way to the World Cup draw in Qatar. He has never knowingly turned down the opportunity to appear on television before in his life. It would be like Carl Froch passing up an opportunity to mention the fact that he fought in front of 80,000 people at Wembley Stadium, or Kanye West turning down an invitation to say something wildly anti-Semitic. All of a sudden, it was open season on the BBC. The Tories, who had spent the last few days lambasting Lineker and attempting to denigrate him from the literal dispatch box in the House of Commons, suddenly started to row back on some of that criticism, with the ever-malleable Rishi Sunak calling Lineker a great footballer and a talented presenter, and describing it as a matter for the BBC, not for the government. In an attempt to distance his party, who had talked about little else for the past few days, from the story as a whole. The Labour Party, which is the party of opposition in the United Kingdom, the only party other than the Conservatives, capable of forming a government at the next election, and widely expected to do just that, swung wildly from most of their senior MPs claiming that Lineker had gone too far in his criticism of the government up to that point, to all of a sudden voicing their impassioned support for him and opposition to his suspension. It is almost as though they said one thing, saw that public opinion had changed, and then said something completely different. Far be it from me, though, to suggest that, 
duplicitousness and the current Labour leadership go hand in hand all too often. Then came an onslaught from rival broadcaster Sky Sports, and most notably from the rather unlikely source of Carver Solkal, who pointed out some of the crippling hypocrisies which surrounded Lineker's suspension, which is the third and final reason why it was an insane decision by the BBC. The BBC is the national broadcaster of the United Kingdom, which has long presented itself as being unscrupulously fair and impartial. That claim has always been rather contentious, given that the government of the day is effectively in control of the BBC budget and its continued existence, which gives the organisation an obvious incentive not to upset them. In April 2017, the BBC board was formed to replace the BBC Trust. The BBC board, appointed by government, sets the strategy for the corporation, assesses the performance of the BBC executive board in delivering the BBC services, and appoints the director general. Among the most senior BBC board members are some, shall we just say, questionable figures when it comes to supposed impartiality. Richard Sharp, the chairman of the BBC since 2021, used to be the current Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's boss when they both worked for Goldman Sachs in the City of London. Sharp was also an advisor to former Conservative Prime Minister Boris Johnson when he was the Mayor of London, and he more recently worked as an economic advisor to Rishi Sunak during the COVID-19 pandemic. A former director of the Centre for Policy Studies, which is a right-wing think tank co-founded by another former Conservative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, Sharp has donated more than £400,000 of his own money to the Conservative Party, and it was recently revealed that just weeks before he was appointed as the new chairman of the BBC in 2021, he helped then-Prime Minister Boris Johnson secure an £800,000 personal loan. Other candidates were allegedly told at the time that there was no point in applying for the role, as Sharp was Johnson's man. I wonder why. Sharp, for what it's worth, claims that there was no conflict of interest. Five months before Sharp's appointment as chairman, Tim Davey was appointed as the BBC's new director general. Another politically neutral figure supposedly, Davey literally stood to be a Conservative Party councillor in Hammersmith back in 1993 and served as deputy chairman of the Hammersmith and Fulham Conservative Association during the 1990s. In August 2020, Davey complained that the BBC needed to, quote, find a better balance of satirical targets rather than constantly aiming jokes at the Tories in response to comedians apparently being too mean about the party that he once stood to represent. Another BBC board member is Sir Robbie Gibb, the brother of Conservative MP Nick Gibb, but a man who is actually very left-wing. Nah, I'm just kidding with you. Gibb served as the Chief of Staff for Conservative MP Francis Maud during the 1990s. He supported Michael Portillo's campaign to become Conservative Party leader in 2001, and he returned to politics in 2017 by becoming Downing Street Director of Communications under Conservative Prime Minister Theresa May. Apparently, having three massive Tories in three of the most senior roles at the BBC is impartial, but a football presenter tweeting in response to someone about the language that is being used to describe migrants being similar to what was used in 1930s Germany, despite the same point having been made by the Auschwitz Memorial Museum, Jewish refugees from 1930s Germany, and a literal Holocaust survivor to Suella Braverman's face, whom she refused to apologise to and refused to refrain on using such incendiary language in the future, well, that is where the BBC draws the line in terms of impartiality breaches. To add to the laughable hypocrisy, former BBC presenters and television figures, who previously went unpunished and apparently didn't breach any rules, unlike Lineker, include the likes of Andrew Neil, Jeremy Clarkson, Alan Sugar, Michael Portillo, and Karen Brady, amongst others. The most outrageous example of all, Andrew Neil, was the face of the BBC's political coverage for the best part of two decades, 
hosting the Daily Politics television programme from 2003 to 2018. During that time, Neil, who claims never to have met Jeffrey Epstein despite appearing in his so-called Little Black Book, served as the chairman of The Spectator, a right-wing British magazine which has published articles praising the Wehrmacht, that is, the armed forces of Nazi Germany, supporting Greek neo-Nazis, and promoting the far-right Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory. Neil, who was the chairman of the Federation of Conservative Students at university, and later worked for the Conservative Party before moving into journalism, tweeted practically non-stop about politics on his Twitter account for years whilst working for the BBC, and could never be accused of impartiality. When a complaint was registered about Neil, the BBC responded, Andrew is a freelancer, and his Twitter account is a personal one. The BBC is not responsible for its content. Quite why that rule might apply to Neil, who presented a politics and current affairs programme, and not to Lineker, another freelancer, who presents a football programme, I will allow you all to try and figure that one out for yourselves. If you want to know truly how mind-numbingly stupid the British press is, Andrew Neil was subsequently invited back onto the BBC after leaving the organisation to found a far-right conspiratorial rival news channel called GB News to discuss whether or not the BBC was right to suspend Gary Lineker. Nope, I am not kidding. Neil, in his eternal wisdom and without even the slightest hint of irony, said that he agreed with Lineker's suspension until the BBC's guidelines had been clarified. There are so many other examples one could give, from Jeremy Clarkson hosting Top Gear on the BBC for 13 years, whilst making apparently non-political statements like performing a Nazi salute, using the N-word, calling Labour Prime Minister Gordon Brown a one-eyed Scottish idiot, and various musings for Murdoch's Sun newspaper without losing his job, before, you know, getting in a fight with one of his producers because he was offered cold meat and soup instead of a steak, that is, all the way through to Alan Sugar, the billionaire host of The Apprentice on the BBC since 2005, who literally tweeted telling his followers to vote Conservative at the 2017 and 2019 general elections, tweeted an edited image of Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn in a car with Adolf Hitler, I wish I was joking, and said that he would leave Britain if Corbyn were to be elected, all without ever being suspended. Or, you know, anyone even suggesting that he might be, and indeed he still remains in that job. If you're struggling to see how directly instructing your followers on Twitter which way to vote on the day of a general election is more impartial than tweeting about the language the governing party is using to describe migrants, then you are not alone. Even Gary Lineker, perhaps most amusingly of all, tweeted Bin Corbyn in April 2017, advocating for the removal of the democratically elected leader of the opposition, without being suspended, or even talked to as far as anyone is aware. For the record, I'm not suggesting that he ought to have been, but clearly, to any reasonable person, that is a more explicitly political view to express on social media than one comparing the language used by the party of government to that used in 1930s Germany. So on Saturday evening, Match of the Day had no host, no pundits, no commentary, and was just 20 minutes long. The less intelligent Tory MPs and media stooges, not realising that public opinion had already shifted, decided to double down, declaring that the latest episode was the best yet. Scott Benton, the Conservative MP for Blackpool South and a certified moron, tweeted, Best match of the day episode in years. Had all the goals in, no expert analysis, and finished quicker than usual so I could make the pub for last orders. What's not to like? Famously, previous match of the day shows have failed to include all of the goals, and have instead just shown highlights of goal kicks, throw-ins, and of people in the crowd scrolling through their phones at half-time. At least Scott managed to get to the pub for last orders though, a definitely normal thing that normal people normally do on a Saturday evening. Another, Sir John Redwood, 
The Conservative MP for Wokingham. Sorry? Wokingham? Wokingham, if you say so, John. Not sure about that. And a man who was presumably knighted for his services to defecating into the national discourse for more than 35 years, tweeted, Great BBC match of the day. All action. Good replay so you could see what happened and understand penalty calls. Pity they did not show more of the football and run each match a bit longer. Too much chat in the previous programmes. I don't know about you, but I sure am glad we've now got Tory multi-millionaires who hate football, have never watched Match of the Day, will never watch it again, and think that all football fans are scum, telling us how football coverage should actually be formatted. Many of these people, both in press and in Parliament, rush to celebrate the increased viewing figures compared to last week's Match of the Day, failing to recognise that the bump in audience was obviously the result of a similar curiosity that so many people have in plane crashes. Sadly, for pretend football fans in the press and in government, the BBC don't seem to agree that having no host, pundits or commentary makes for a better product. And yesterday, they backed down on every single demand that they had made of Lineker. He refused to delete his tweets, refused to apologise for his tweets, refused to promise not to tweet about anything that could be considered political in the future, and the BBC, in response, and with no other option, given that all of their other football-related staff were refusing to work, and they had zero grounds upon which to actually terminate Lineker's contract, were forced into a grovelling retreat. It is an embarrassing retreat for the BBC, and it has done further damage to the Tory brand, which is already about as tarnished as Bernard L. Madoff investment securities, but the cynic in me says that there will be those who are quietly confident that whilst they didn't get their desired outcome, this has still hurt the BBC, and there are now even fewer people who would be willing to defend and go out to bat for it when the time comes, or at least that they wouldn't do so with as much passion or interest. Amidst all of this, the UK government's new extreme illegal migration bill has largely been overlooked. That is despite it being condemned by numerous human rights organisations, everyone involved in it being well aware that it won't work, and the Conservatives actually needing it not to work as, without scapegoating refugees, at this stage, they would have no one to blame their failures on other than trans people, I guess. Suella Braverman herself admitted, in a letter to MPs, that the bill was more than 50% likely to break international human rights laws, meaning that it is an illegal migration bill, in the sense that it is illegal, rather than the migrants more so than anything else. But she urged them to vote for it regardless. On the bright side, there are some cracking fixtures on next week's match of the day, and I reckon that they might even show you all of the goals. That is it for today's video. Thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know, you know, your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on, both for HITC7s and also my backup channel, both of which should be on your screens now. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.